Good morning. Let me try that again. Good morning. Good to see you this morning. Good to be together to worship God. If you have your Bible with you, please take it out and go over into the book of Acts. Go over to Acts chapter 8, please. Acts chapter 8. This past week, in our reading of the first five chapters of Acts, we saw something. We saw something amazing take place. We saw a massive explosion of the gospel. We saw the gospel convert 3,000 people on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. We saw that number of disciples grow to at least 5,000 males, adult males, by the time you get to Acts chapter 4. And then in Acts chapter 5 and verse 14, the scripture says that the church continued to multiply with believers. In the first five chapters of Acts, we read about the church grow like a wildfire, but unfortunately, when we get to Acts chapter 7 this week, we're going to read about something terrible taking place. We're going to read about a man who was a Christian, and he was also a preacher and a deacon in the church. He's going to be murdered for his faith. He's going to be stoned to death because he preached a sermon to the Sanhedrin Council about Israel's constant rejection of God, and they didn't like that message. They did not like Stephen rehearsing Israel's pattern or history for constantly rejecting God's messengers, and so they killed him. They murdered him. In fact, his murder would actually mark the beginning of a terrible wave of persecution against the church in Jerusalem. That's exactly what we find in Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. Going back to the verses that Brother Tom so graciously read for us this morning, I want you to notice how after the death of Stephen, Saul of Tarsus, the Bible says Saul of Tarsus began a great persecution against the church. Saul of Tarsus began a great assault against the church in Jerusalem. He did that because he wanted to destroy the church. He wanted to stomp out the church. He wanted to obliterate the Christian movement before it got a hand. The scripture says that Saul of Tarsus began a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. In fact, this persecution was so great It was so bad that Luke, the writer of Acts, tells us that the church in Jerusalem was forced to scatter. The church in Jerusalem was forced to flee the city in an effort to save their lives. But interestingly enough, even though they were forced to leave their families and their homes in Jerusalem, that didn't stop them from continuing to preach the word, right? That didn't stop them from continuing to go out and tell people the glorious news about Jesus Christ. The Bible says that despite being scattered, they continue to go out preaching the gospel. In fact, when you continue reading this chapter, Acts 8, and when you read the next two chapters after it, you see that as the disciples went out preaching the gospel, they actually started preaching it to some very unique people. They actually started preaching it to some very different people. They actually started preaching it to some very unusual people when you compare them to the other conversions that have been mentioned up to this point in the book. You see, brothers and sisters, we got to understand that up to this point in the book of Acts, the gospel has only gone to the Jews. The gospel has only gone to the physical descendants of Abraham. It's only been preached in Jerusalem and Judea, but beginning here in Acts chapter 8, 
And going all the way through Acts chapter 10, we're actually going to find the gospel leaving Jerusalem. We're actually going to find it being preached beyond the Jewish people, and it's going to start going out to some very unusual people. For example, here in Acts chapter 8, beginning with verse number 5, we're going to find the gospel leaving the city of Jerusalem and actually going to the city of Samaria. We're going to find the gospel going from just being preached to the Jews to actually being preached to the people of Samaria. Are you in Acts chapter 8? Look at verse number 5. In Acts chapter 8 and verse number 5, the Bible says this. After telling us about those in Jerusalem who had been scattered and they went out still preaching the word, Verse 5 says, Philip, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. The crowds with one accord were giving attention to what was said by Philip as they heard and saw the signs, the miraculous signs which he was performing. For in the case of many who had unclean spirits, they were coming out of them, shouting with a loud voice, and many who had been paralyzed and lamed were healed. So there was much rejoicing in that city. Now, there was a man named Simon who formerly was practicing magic in the city and astonishing the people of Samaria, claiming to be someone great. And they all, from the smallest to the, to the greatest, were given attention to him, saying, This man is called the great power of God. And they were given him attention because he had for a long time astonished them with his magic arts. But when they believed Philip, preaching the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized, men and women alike. I want you to notice carefully what's going on here in these verses. Do you see that? Notice how after the Christians were forced out of Jerusalem because of persecution, the Holy Spirit through Luke, the writer, tells us that one of those Christians named Philip, and keep in mind this is the same Philip who was appointed to be a deacon back in Acts chapter 6. He's also in that list. He's one of the seven men who was appointed to help take care of the widows in the Jerusalem church. The Bible says that this man, Philip, after he was forced out of Jerusalem, he left Jerusalem and went down to the city of Samaria. He left Jerusalem and he went down to the people of Samaria. And when he got to the people of Samaria, verse 5 says that he proclaimed Christ to them. Verse 6 says that he performed great miracles and wonders among the people. Verse 12 says that he preached the good news about the kingdom or the rule of God. And he also told them about the name or the authority of Jesus Christ. He also immersed or baptized men and women alike. The Bible says that once Philip left Jerusalem, he went and did God's work in the city of Samaria and to really be able to appreciate what's going on here. I think it is important that we understand some things about the relationship between the Jews and Philip is a Jew. We need to understand some things about the relationship between the Jews and the Samaritans at this time. You see, my friends, during this time, and for hundreds and hundreds of years, the Jewish people really looked down on the people of Samaria. They had a strong prejudice against the people of Samaria. John and his gospel actually makes a reference to this in John chapter 4 and verse number 9. When explaining or trying to emphasize why it was so weird and strange and radical for Jesus to be speaking to a Samaritan woman at a well. In John 4 to verse 9, John says that was radical, weird, and strange because at that time, the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. The Jews hated the Samaritans. The Jews had disdain for the Samaritans. 
They could not stand those people. And the main reason why was because they had Gentile blood in them. It was because they regarded them as nothing more than mixed or half breeds. You see, since the Samaritans were a combination of Jew and Gentile, the full blooded Jews had absolutely no respect for them. The full blooded Jews had an intense level of hatred for them. Let me tell you something. We may think that this race issue that we get so hung up on in our time and that we talk so much about in our time is a new thing. But the fact of the matter is, it is not. Brothers and sisters, this race and racism issue that we talk so much about in our society today, it is not a 21st century problem. It is not just a 20th century problem or just a Western civilization problem. No, brothers and sisters, that's a Bible problem. That's a problem you can read about in the scriptures. That's a problem that you can read about going back to the time of Jesus. That's a 2000 year old problem. That's even a problem you can read about in the Old Testament. Going back to the time of the Assyrian captivity which took place in about the 8th century B.C. The scriptures tell us that the Jews, going back to that time, had an intense hatred and prejudice towards the people of Samaria. They wanted nothing to do with the people of Samaria. They didn't want to talk to them. They didn't want to associate with them. They didn't want to befriend them, travel through their land. They didn't even want to touch the same objects that they touched. They hated those people, but now all of a sudden here under the new covenant of Jesus Christ, what do we find taking place? Well, here in Acts chapter 8, under the new covenant of Jesus Christ, we not only find a Jewish Christian traveling intentionally, mind you, to the city of Samaria, but we also find him preaching the gospel to the people of Samaria. We also find him immersing the people of Samaria. We also find him happily inviting the people of Samaria to join him in the kingdom of God. When you understand the backstory between the relationship or the hostility between the Jews and the Samaritans, when you read this, you have to conclude that this is an unusual case of conversion. The Samaritans are an unusual case of conversion found here in, in the book of Acts, but they're not the only ones because we move on in this same chapter and we find a second unusual or radical case of conversion. And this one had to do with a man named Simon. Simon, remember, Acts 8 and verse 9 tells us that Simon, Simon was also among the people of Samaria. Simon was among these people. The scripture specifically says that Simon was a sorcerer. He, he was a magician of some kind. He was someone who claimed to be something great. Like Benny Hinn and Peter Popoff today, he claimed to have miraculous power from God. In fact, when the people of Samaria witnessed his tricks and his magic, they called him the great power of God. They really thought this man had power from God. But the truth is, like Benny Hinn and Peter Popoff today, this man was nothing more than a fraud. He was a deceiver. He was a trickster. But I want you to notice what happened to him when he also heard the glorious gospel. Acts 8 and verse 13, after telling us that Philip was baptizing men and women alike, the scripture says, even Simon, even Simon, Luke says, even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued on with Philip. And as he observed signs and great miracles taking place, he was constantly amazed. He was constantly amazed because Philip wasn't a fraud. Philip was doing legitimate miracles. Notice how among the people of Samaria who believed and obeyed the glorious gospel was Simon of all people. Simon the sorcerer? 
Simon the deceiver, Simon the man who for so many years he fooled the people of Samaria with his tricks and his magic. Simon is another unusual case of conversion taking place in Acts chapter 8, but we're still not done because as we press on in this chapter, we find yet another unusual, unusual case of conversion, and this one actually has to do with a man from Ethiopia. A man from Ethiopia who was actually someone very important. A man from Ethiopia who held a very high position. He was actually the treasurer for Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. This is an intelligent man. Nobody's going to put a dummy in charge of their money. And so this is a smart man. He's also a eunuch. He's an emasculated man who evidently was also a proselyte. He had been converted and to the Jewish religion, and he had just finished worshiping God in the city of Jerusalem. He was in Jerusalem worshiping, worshiping at the temple, and as he was traveling along a, des a deserted road or a desert road going back to, to Ethiopia, the scripture tells us that this man was sitting in his chariot, and he was reading the Bible. He was reading the word of God. Specifically, he was reading from Isaiah chapter 53. He was reading about the humiliating and terrible death of Jesus, the Messiah. But unfortunately, he didn't have a clue what he was reading. He didn't know who Jesus was. He didn't know about the scheme of redemption that was being that had been accomplished through Jesus Christ. And thankfully, God intervenes and he sends him a preacher. He sends him the same preacher that he had sent to the Samaritans. You see, after preaching the gospel to the Samaritans, the scripture says that, that Philip, this man Philip, he was led by the Lord to the Ethiopian eunuch. And once he found the man's chariot, he goes into the man's chariot and he finds him reading the scriptures and he asks him, do you understand what you're reading? And the eunuch said, how can I understand that somebody help me? I need some help. And so look at what the Bible says in verse 34. Acts 8, 34. After telling us that this man was reading from Isaiah 53 about Jesus, verse 34 says, the eunuch answered Philip and said, please tell me of whom does the prophet say this? Who is he talking about? Who is this man? who is going to be like a lamb before its shears is silent. Who is this man who is going to have his life removed from the earth? Who is this guy? Is Isaiah talking about himself or is he talking about someone else? Verse 35, then Philip opened his mouth. You see, you can't do evangelism without opening your mouth. <laughs> can't win souls without opening your mouth. And that's important. In all seriousness, we, we got to open our mouths. Got to do it. And beginning from this scripture, beginning from Isaiah 53, he preached Jesus to him. He preached to him about the death of Jesus. He preached to him about the burial of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus. He even preached to him about the necessity of baptism for remission of sins. Someone says, how do you know that, Sean? Well, look at verse 36. It says, as they went along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? Now, wait a minute. Just a few minutes ago, this guy didn't even know who Jesus was. He didn't even know that Jesus was the man Isaiah was speaking of in Isaiah 53. But now all of a sudden he wants to get baptized. In fact, he doesn't want to wait until Sunday and do it in front of a, a church assembly. He doesn't even want to wait until he get back, gets back to Ethiopia to get baptized. No, he says, I want to do it right now, right here in the middle of the desert. Why is this so urgent to him right now? Well, I submit to you that the reason why baptism is so urgent for this man is because Philip told him about how urgent it was. The implication of this is a man can't preach Jesus properly unless he also preaches baptism for remission of sin. 
Philip preached Jesus to him, and that included preaching about the need for baptism. And this man wants to get baptized immediately. I don't want to wait till I get back to Ethiopia. And he says, what prevents me from doing this? Verse 37, Philip said, if you believe with all your hearts, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he ordered the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water. Notice no sprinkling, no pouring water. This is immersion. This is Bible baptism. They both went down to the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when he came up out of the water, notice again, to come up out of the water, you first got to go down into the water. This is common sense. This is immersion. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch no longer saw him, but he went on his way rejoicing. He's happy because now he knows he's right with God. Now, I want to submit to you that once again, we find an unusual case of conversion. And this is an unusual case of conversion. Not just because this man is from Ethiopia. And not just because this man is the treasurer for Candace. And not just because this man is even a proselyte. No, the main reason why this is an unusual and radical case of conversion is because this man is a eunuch. He's a eunuch. You see, when you study your Old Testament very carefully, you see that in Deuteronomy chapter 23 and verse 1, under the Old Testament law of Moses, people like this, emasculated men, men who had their male organ cut off, they were not allowed into the assembly of the Lord. They were not allowed among the people of God. They were to be isolated from the congregation of Israel. That was the requirement of God under the law of Moses. But here in Acts chapter 8, what do we find taking place? Well, here in Acts chapter 8, we find a eunuch, an emasculated man, hearing the glorious gospel, believing the glorious gospel, being baptized into the body of Jesus Christ and being welcomed and to the congregation of God. This is another unusual case of conversion. But we're still not done. Because when we move on to Acts chapter 9, we find what may be the most unusual and the most radical case of conversion in the whole book of Acts, and that is the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus, the same Saul of Tarsus, mind you, who began a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, according to Acts 8 and verse 1. The same Saul of Tarsus who forced the Christians in Jerusalem to scatter. The same Saul of Tarsus who was a fierce persecutor of the church. The same Saul of Tarsus who went into the homes of Christians and drug them out of their homes and locked them up. And, and he wanted to destroy the church. Here in Acts chapter 9, we see that this man, this man, who at one time hated Christians, when he was presented with the truth, he changed. He humbled himself to the will of God. He believed that Jesus was the Lord and the Christ, and he was baptized for the purpose of having his sins washed away by the blood of Jesus. Acts 22 and verse 16. You see, like the Samaritans and like Simon the sorcerer and like the Ethiopian eunuch, this man Saul, he also becomes a Christian. He also becomes a disciple of Jesus Christ. In fact, not only does he become a disciple of Jesus Christ, but as we have been learning in our online Bible classes, this man Saul will go on to become a very influential disciple. He would go on to become the great Apostle Paul. He would go on to spread the gospel throughout much of the known Roman world at this time. And he would even give his life, sacrifice his life for the cause of Christ. Saul of Tarsus, Saul the persecuted. He's another unusual case of conversion here in this unit of the book of Acts. But believe it or not, we're still not done. Because as we go into the next chapter, Acts chapter 10, 
we find yet another unusual case of conversion, and this one has to do with a man named Cornelius. Cornelius. You see, the thing that makes Cornelius conversion so unusual is because unlike the 3,000 Jews who were baptized in Acts 2, and unlike Saul the persecutor, and even unlike the Samaritans, Cornelius was a full-blooded Gentile. He's a full-blooded Gentile. Someone says, what do you mean when you say Gentile. When we say Gentile, my friend, we mean he wasn't a Jew. We mean he wasn't a Hebrew. We mean that he was just like us. He was from the other nations. This is an important thing for us to highlight because under the Old Testament law of Moses, people like this, Gentiles, people from the other nations, they were not part of the family of God. They were not part of the children of God. Only the Israelites had that privilege. Only the physical descendants of Abraham had a close and intimate relationship with God. The Gentiles, the people from the other nations, they were considered as immoral heathens who for the most part were involved in paganism and idolatry. They were not God's people. Now, I want to show you something at the beginning of Acts chapter 10. Look at the first two verses. You see the first two verses in Acts chapter 10? Notice how in the first two verses, the Holy Spirit goes out of his way to tell us some things about Cornelius. In Acts chapter 10, verses 1 through 2, we learn that Cornelius, even though he's a Gentile, he's a religious man. He's a very religious man. He's a giving man. He's a praying man. He's a worshiper of God. He's devout. He fears the Lord with all his household. At the beginning of Acts chapter 10, we learn that this man, Cornelius, for the most part, he was a really good man. But unfortunately, even though he's a good man, he's not a saved man. He's not a man who has had his sins washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ and the Lord. The Lord certainly knew that. The Lord knew everything about Cornelius. And just like in all these other cases, the Lord's going to send him a preacher. The Lord's going to send to him the apostle Peter. And the apostle Peter is going to come to him. In Caesarea, and he's going to preach the gospel to him in his whole household. And after Peter preaches the gospel to Cornelius and his household, the scripture says that the power of the Holy Spirit was poured out from heaven upon Cornelius and the rest of the Gentiles. The Holy Spirit's power was immersed upon this Gentile household, and they started speaking in foreign languages miraculously that they had never formally been taught. They start speaking in tongues. And the scripture says that when Peter saw that going on, he knew what God was saying. He knew what the Lord was saying from heaven. He knew that because the Gentiles had received the miraculous power from the spirit, just like he and the other apostles did in Acts chapter two, that meant that salvation was now available to the Gentiles, just like it was available to the Jews. And so look at what Peter said in verse 47, Acts 10, 47. He says, after he saw these Gentiles miraculously speaking in tongues, he says, surely no one can refuse water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we can he. And he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And they asked him to stay on a few days. Notice how while the Gentiles were not considered as God's people under the Old Testament law of Moses, now under the New Covenant, the Gentiles are being grafted in. The Gentiles are being spiritually adopted by God the Father. The Gentiles are now being saved by the blood of Jesus Christ in the same way as the Jews. 
what I just want you to see is here at the beginning of Acts 8 and going all the way through Acts chapter 10, Luke is showing us some amazing things. Luke is showing us some unusual conversions. Luke is showing us about a period of time when some very interesting people are being welcomed into the church of our Lord. That's what's going on here in this unit. In fact, I want to suggest that from this unit, these three chapters, we learn some important things about God. We learn some important things about God's grace. We learn some important things about God's unmerited favor. We learn some important things about God's willingness to offer his love and his forgiveness and his mercy and his grace to all people, even though no person deserves it. No person deserves it. Let me tell you something. The Jews in Acts chapter 2 that we read about this past week, they didn't deserve God's love and his mercy. They didn't deserve God's grace that was extended to them on the day of Pentecost, and neither did the Samaritans. And neither did Simon the sorcerer, and neither did the Ethiopian eunuch, and neither did Saul of Tarsus or Cornelius or us. Let me tell you something. I don't care. I don't care how good you may think you are. I don't, how, I don't care how good we may think we are. I don't care how many times we have been to church services. I don't care how long we've been Christians. I don't care how many people we help or how moral we may think we are because we've all sinned against a holy and righteous God. None of us deserves his forgiveness. None of us deserve his love. None of us deserve his mercy. None of us deserve his grace. But thankfully, even though none of us deserve his grace, nor could we ever, ever earn his grace, God still offers it to us. He still offers us his grace, ultimately, through his son, Jesus Christ, John 3, 16. That's what that verse is all about. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, everyone. Here's the grace part. The grace part is right here. He gave something. He gave something that we cannot earn. He gave something that we don't deserve. He gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. John 3 verse 16 is showing us that the ultimate expression of God's love and grace is exercised or found in his son Jesus Christ. Paul will say it this way in Titus 2 and verse 11. Paul says, for the grace of God, the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation not to just some men like the Calvinists suggest. Instead, the scripture says the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, all men. When the Bible says all men here, brothers and sisters, it's talking about all people. It's talking about all men and women. It's talking about all nations. It's talking about people from all kinds of different backgrounds. It's talking about people from the north and the south and the east and the west. It's talking about people like you. I don't care what sins you may have committed in your life. You're the Apostle Paul, a man who himself tried to destroy the church. Paul says that God has extended his grace to everyone. There is no unit in the book of Acts that shows us this better than Acts 8 through 10. In Acts 8 through 10, we learn some things about God's grace. But not only do we learn some things about God's grace, secondly, I want us to understand that from this unit in Acts, we also learn some things about God's gospel. We learn some things about God's gospel. We learn that when it come to, comes to God's gospel, God's gospel, gospel is powerful. 
It is extremely powerful. In fact, it's the most powerful message in the world. Romans 1 and verse 16, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it, referring to the gospel, is the power of God for salvation to everyone, not just some, to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Notice how Paul says that God's power to save our souls is found in the gospel. God's power to reform us is found in the gospel. God's power to transform us is found in the gospel. I think we can all agree that if there is anyone who could accurately testify of that, it was the Apostle Paul. Even though Paul was a fierce opponent of the church, through the gospel he got put into a saved condition and he transformed into becoming one of the greatest advocates of the gospel that the world has ever known. The gospel saved and changed the Apostle Paul, but not only did it change Paul. Go in your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Look who else it changed. It changed people who even lived in the wicked, immoral city of the first century, the city of Corinth. Let me tell you something. Las Vegas has nothing on the city of Corinth. The, Cor Corinth was well known in its time for being a very immoral and wicked city. In fact, to even be called a Corinthian during this time was a degrading thing. And so when it came to the people Paul taught and converted through the gospel, he says in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 9, verse 9, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God, do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor our daughters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 11, such were some of you. You Corinthians, you did this stuff. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. Notice how Paul says... That even though many of these people were involved in just gross sins, they were involved in fornication, idolatry, adultery, homosexuality, thievery, drunkenness. Even though they were involved in every sin under the sun, Paul says that when they came to God, they changed. They reformed their lives. They transformed from being wicked children of Satan into becoming righteous children of God. The gospel changed these people. And just like the gospel changed those people, guess what? It continues to change people today. It continues to change hearts today. We got to understand that while the gospel is an ancient message, it's just as powerful in the 21st century as it was in the first century. Even today, the gospel has the power to transform every person that is willing to humbly submit to it. The question, though, is, is how are the people going to hear it? More precisely, how are the people in the Valley of the Sun going to hear it? How are the people in our small little part of the world going to hear the glorious gospel? Well, as you think about that, I want to go back to where we started. In Acts 8 and verse 4, remember, the Christians, during the time of the first century, they were suffering. They were going through something far worse than the coronavirus pandemic. They were being persecuted for their faith. They were being forced to leave and flee from their homes, and yet despite difficult times in their lives, the scripture says, they were scattered, but they went about preaching the word. I love this verse. I love this verse because it blows away the notion that the great commission that the Lord gives in Matthew 28 was only given to the apostles. Here we see that the great commission wasn't just given to the apostles. Instead, it was given to all Christians. It was given to all disciples. Let me tell you something. This man, Philip, that is mentioned here in Acts 8 and verse 5, this man was not an apostle. This man was not a special ambassador of Jesus Christ. Instead, you know what he was? He was just an ordinary saint like us. 
He was just an ordinary Christian like us. He was not an apostle. And yet, even though he's not an apostle during a time of terrible persecution, he still goes out preaching the word. As a Jew at this time, he overcomes the sin of racism that was prevalent during this time. And he preaches the gospel to Samaritans. And he preaches the gospel to a man from Ethiopia. And he even shared the gospel with a notorious false teacher named Simon. Simon. You see, Philip shared the gospel with as many people as he could without showing partiality. And let us follow his example. Like Philip, let us be the kind of people who are willing to share the gospel with any and everyone, with religious and with non-religious folks. With white people, with black people, Asian people, Hispanic people, Indian people, all people, rich people, poor people, educated people, uneducated people, people who are currently practicing homosexuality or they're transgenders or they're in unlawful marriages or maybe they even have criminal backgrounds. Like Philip, let's be the kind of people who are willing to share the gospel with any and everyone. And let's do that because God loves everyone. And he wants everyone to be saved. Now, maybe there's someone here this morning and you say, I need to respond to the gospel. If that's your desire, my friend, I want you to know that we're here to we're here to help you. We love you. We want to help as many people as we can be brought into the kingdom of God. And if your need here this morning is to. Confess your faith in Christ and repent of your sins and be immersed in the waters of baptism. It would be our pleasure to be part of this great story in Acts and welcome you into the family of God. As the Lord would command us to. And so if we can help anyone with that this morning, we're going to invite you to come to the front right here and right now. Let's stand. Let's sing together.